All right, let's go ahead and get started. First of all, I just want to say thanks for joining me. This is Get Out of Town, version control for data. This is part of the APAC OUC webinar tour, so big thanks to the APAC OUC for putting the event together, as well as to Francisco for doing all the hard work. Brief, safe, harbor statement. I don't intend to show you anything you can't do already today. Uh, but just in case I slip, please don't make any purchasing decisions based on what I say here today. My name is Dan McGann. I'm an Oracle developer advocate. I focus primarily on the JavaScript and HTML5 communities. I have my contact info on screen, so if you'd like to reach out via email, you'll see my email address there, as well as my Twitter handle. If you want to follow me on Twitter, uh, also at the very bottom, JSAO, that's for JavaScript and Oracle. That's my blog where I blog about all things JavaScript and Oracle. Uh, feel free to check that out as well. Here's an overview of what we'll be doing today. I'm going to kick things off with a very high level, just light review of Git and some basic functionality that we use Git for. Then I'll get into version control and the database. And finally, I'll talk about appification or taking some of the concepts we learned about in part two and actually how they would apply then in a real application um, as, it, as it's not always the same as uh, doing the demos in SQL Dev or something like that. Well, let's start with an overview of Git. Hopefully everybody here is using Git. Of course, Git is just a version control system. It's probably the most popular at this point. I think it's going to take over from CVS if it's not already. Uh, started by Linus Torvalds in 2005, same guy that created Linux. Definitely makes me feel kind of bad knowing he's created these, these uh, applications which have been so highly successful. Uh, it's a distributed version control system, which is unique in that you get uh, sort of a local copy of the entire repo, which is great, especially if you are disconnected uh, from the internet. You can keep working, being productive, no problem. Uh, it's also very fast, and one of the ways that it um, keeps its speed up is that it avoids duplication of data, and it does that by just tracking deltas or diffs and changes between files, uh, which is very, very nice. Here's a very high level example of using Git. So uh, we start with Git, and that's uh, the command line interface. And I'm saying Git init. I'm using init to start a new project, and I'm calling it my project. And so what Git is going to do is going to create a new directory called my dash project. And within that directory, it's going to create a hidden directory for Git where it stores all of its metadata. It's then possible for me to change directories into that project, and I can add two files. I'm using touch here to create two empty files. One is file1.txt and then file2.txt. And then I'm using git add with the period, which basically says add all of the files to essentially the uh, staging area. And once I've added my the, the files that I want to the staging area, I can then use git commit to commit my changes, and I'm passing a dash M for message and specifying a message that'll go along with that commit. So at that point, uh, we're in the master uh, branch, and we have two files committed into the repo. Of course, eventually, and one of the primary reasons we use a version control repository, we may want to make some changes to the data. Uh, or in this case, uh, the files that we're using in our application. So I'll use git branch to create a new branch. I'm calling this one my-fork. And once I've created it, I can then check it out or make it the current um, branch that I'm working with. So I'm saying git check out my fork, and it says, okay, we've switched to that, that branch. So while I'm in that branch, I'm using touch to create a third file here. And then I'm using git add to add that third file to the staging area. And then git commit uh, dash m again for the message, fix the bug, to commit this new file to the new branch, essentially. Uh, so now has one file changed. Now, of course, 
at some point, we probably want to bring, if we had fixed some bug of some sort, we probably want to bring those changes back into the main line or production. And so the way we would do that is by merging these two branches back together. So here's how we would do that. I return to the master branch by using git checkout master. And once I'm there, I'm, I'm just using the regular command to list the files in the directory. And so note that we don't see file three. We've gone back to master, which has not seen file three yet. So I use git merge and then the branch that I want to merge into master. And it does a fast forward. It can do that uh, kind of quick fast forward here because of the types of changes I made. But then when I do the LS, you'll see all three files are now in the repo. And at that point, if I no longer need the branch that I'd created before to kind of do the work independently of the main line, I can go ahead and delete that with git branch dash D and then specify the branch that I want to delete. All right, so that is uh, a very, very high level overview of, of using Git in a nutshell. Let's talk about version control in the database, which is a bit more complex. Turns out there are three common scenarios where you might want to do this kind of thing. The first of which is what if analysis, where basically you have some data and a table. And you want to allow end users to be able to manipulate the data to see how changing the data might look. But you don't actually want to make those changes, of course, unless you like the way things look. And then you want to be able to make those changes permanent. So what if analysis is definitely one. We have long transactions. Uh, typically, transactions in databases are just going to last uh, sub-seconds. But there are situations where you want to manage some kind of uh, changes, inserts, and updates over uh, a period of time, perhaps a day, a week, even months. You want to take those changes as a unit and then merge them into production when the changes have kind of evolved and now they're ready to be moved into production. So long transactions are another use case. And then auditing, which is uh, perhaps another simple one, uh, just you know, changing or, or rather uh, seeing what kind of changes have happened to, to data over time is a, is a good use case for this kind of thing. So what I'm going to do now is just give you a demo, uh, sort of show you how this looks like at a high level in, in an actual application so that you can kind of get a sense for what I'm talking about here. So what I'm showing you here is an Oracle Jet application. And I have some movies that I'm listing. Uh, I actually got this data from Wikipedia. And again, it makes me feel kind of bad. Uh, like we'll go into, let's say, Laura Croft here. And so we see some of the movie metadata as well as the various expenses related to it. A pretty cool Wikipedia page, but man, it really makes you it really does surprise you how much these folks are getting paid or really just how much it takes to, to make a, a big budget movie these days. So uh, $49.2 in production costs for Laura Croft. And of course, Angelina Jolie was walking away with $12 million after that movie. I go back and we look at Unbreakable. We'll see uh, that production costs again took the lead at 20, almost 23 million. And then we have Bruce Willis making 20 million and Samuel L. Jackson making only 7 million. All right, now imagine that we are developers and DBAs working for a movie production company, right? And so this application is the app that they use to maintain uh, sort of, sort of the, the budget, if you will, for any given movie. And they've had this functionality the actual metadata and the expenses for a while, right? They can come in here, they can edit the, the, the details for the expense items. But what they have not had and what they asked us to implement was this new scenarios functionality over here on the left. And the idea here is that they, this is the what if analysis example where you know, they're, they're asking for the ability to say, hey, we wanna play with the numbers some, see how it looks. And then if we like the way it looks, we'll go ahead and, and merge those changes back in. So let's give it a shot. So I'll click add a new scenario here. And I'm going to say um, Bruce 
it. Yes. We'll create this scenario. And now you see that we have two different scenarios. And if we toggle between the two, they uh, are exactly the same because there's no difference between them. But if we go into uh, Bruce gets more money, or less money rather, <laughs> he's already got 20 million. Well, let's see what would happen if we said, all right, well, we're gonna bump this down, maybe 5 million, Bruce gets 15, so we'll save that. And then, uh, well, Samuel L. Jackson, if we took Bruce down uh, five, we can bump Samuel L. Jackson up to 12, so he's a bit happier. But you know what, we still gotta shave a little off the top, so let's go ahead and I guess we'll get rid of uh, Robin Wright Penn, and we'll just delete that line item right out. Okay, so now we're starting to see the the benefit here, right? Uh, how an actual end user might be able to do what if analysis using version control over data in the database, right? And if they like the changes, okay, Bruce gets less money, this goes around, it's approved by everybody, they can go back in, and then they can merge this back into the live data set. When you click that, we're gonna get rid of this scenario, and now it's just live, right? So if I refresh this and everything comes back fresh out of the database, you can see um, Bruce is at 15, Samuel's at 12, and the other person isn't here any longer. So this is the idea. This is uh, kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about version control uh, with, with data. Now, the question for you, and I want you to kind of just ponder this one a little bit, is how would you go about implementing such functionality in, in your applications? And the first time I did this talk, I got some really uh, interesting answers. Uh, the best, my favorite was, well, <laughs> let's export the data in JSON format and move it into Git. <laughs> and I should say, this is not a talk about Git specifically. Um, to be clear, this is a talk about a feature of Oracle Database, a rather lesser known feature that's incredibly powerful. And I want to A, let you know about this feature, but also B, I wanna teach you about this feature using some concepts you'd likely already know from Git. And so I've actually had to do something like this in the past. I used to uh, manage a, a testing application where folks would create quizzes and then they would allow end users to take them. And then, of course, you know, they'd want to update or uh, make changes to a given quiz, maybe add or remove questions, modify existing questions, that kind of stuff. And it was a tough challenge because, of course, if somebody from the past went in to view their quiz as it was previously, well, you have to maintain all of that versioning of the data, how it looked at any given point in time. Very difficult chore. What I didn't know about at the time was Workspace Manager. And Workspace Manager would have made my life so much easier. So my goal here, if, if you're wondering, you know, what's the takeaway from this talk? The takeaway is going to be that if you run into one of those three scenarios I showed you before, um, either the what if, the long transaction, or auditing, and you uh, want to know of the tool that you can use in Oracle Database to implement it, it's Workspace Manager. You can flip back to this talk. You can get into the docs at that point in time and then uh, put this to use for you and your applications. So Workspace Manager allows you to version enable one or more tables. And I should say that this is just a, a built-in feature of Oracle Database. I believe it's included with all editions except the Express Edition, but it's a no-cost option. So like PL SQL or like Application Express, it's there for you if you wanna use it, uh, but you don't have to use it if you don't want to. So you can version enable one or more tables, and then the rows within them can have multiple versions. Uh, the versioning infrastructure is transparent in such a way that the SQL you're executing doesn't have to change, but what actually happens behind the scenes when you execute that SQL is, of course, going to be very different. And Workspace Manager is based around the concept of workspaces, which can be thought of as a logical grouping of row versions. I like to think of them more like branches from Git. So basically, you're gonna do changes in a workspace and eventually merge that back into the production data. That's kind of the idea here. So I've created this little Git users cheat sheet for Workspace Manager so that we can kind of learn just a few of the concepts at a high level 
Um, so let's start with Git init. So Git init is what I use to, you know, get started with Git, right? Create a new project and, and do some work. Well, if we're doing the same with Workspace Manager, we would use this package. In fact, we do a lot of things with Workspace Manager using this package. It's a PLSQL package. It's uh, dbms underscore wm for Workspace Manager. And we just in uh, invoke enable versioning. So we pass in a table name here, and then it will version enable that table. So that's how we get started with it. Uh, and Git, we have the concept of the master branch, which usually refers to the code that's actually sitting in production. Well, in Workspace Manager, that is known or referred to as the live uh, version or the live workspace. With Git, we have Git branch to create a new branch and start working in a new branch. Well, with Workspace Manager, we invoke the create workspace procedure. With Git, we have Git checkout, which takes us to a particular branch, makes it the current branch. With Workspace Manager, we have go to workspace. With Git, we have commit, whereas with Workspace Manager, we have create save point. Now, there was this concept with Git called add, and that's when we're adding uh, certain files to the staging area so that we can then uh, commit those uh, isolated from other files. There is no concept of the staging area with Workspace Manager. So that doesn't apply here. And then, of course, uh, we want to get uh, things back into the live or production or master uh, branch. So we have git merge with git. And of course, we have um, something very similar with Workspace Manager. It's merge workspace. All right, what I'm going to do at this point in time is basically show you um, the exact same demo I just did. But rather than at a high level using a fancy GUI with Oracle Jet, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it down and I'm just going to use SQL Developer and kind of show you the moving pieces so that you get a better sense of how I put that demo together. Take a look. All right, so the first thing I need to do actually is shut down my node web server so that it is no longer connected to the database. And then I will disconnect and SQL developer from my movie budget user as well. And so I am connected as sys. I'm using the DevDay VM, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but you can see I'm just running VirtualBox and that's running the DevDay VM. So I'm connected to that, I'm connected to sys. And what I'm gonna do is just drop that movie budget user. And then I'm gonna execute recover from dropped user. This is one of the other procedures in that uh, Workspace Manager package. Once I've done that, I can recreate the user and then uh, give the user some, some quota on disk. I can give some basic grants. And then perhaps most importantly is this part down here, I'm going to use the DBMS Workspace Manager package to grant this user some privileges related to the Workspace Manager functionality. And you can see that user here. So we'll go ahead and run this script. Oops, let's try that again. All right, so movie budget user is dropped and recreated. I can now connect as the movie budget user and I'll just show you, nothing up my sleeve. We have no tables at this time. So I'll move over to this second script. And what this is, is essentially recreating the schema that uh, is storing all the information on movies. And I'll just kind of walk through this before running it. So well, the first thing I'm doing is setting define off so that the inserts that are below this uh, run without any issues. And I'm creating a table, of course, to store the various movies we want to look at stores the name and when the movie came out. I wanted the script to run in 11G, maybe even 10G. So I'm using the traditional sequence and trigger for the primary key management. Beneath that table, you'll see the movie budget lines. And of course, uh, this points up to that parent table, the movies table. Uh, we store some info about the lines, such as the name and the amount of money. Again, the uh, sequence and trigger. And then finally, I have this table over here, budget scenarios. And you can imagine what this is going to store, the, the scenarios that went over here on the left. And I'll explain how this works in a little bit. But basically, 
Workspace Manager has the concept of workspaces, but Workspace Manager knows nothing about my movies. And I wanted to be able to actually uh, version data at essentially the movie level in a way here. It's, it's kind of a, a, a bit of a trick the way I'm using um, Workspace Manager, but it works quite well as you'll see here in a moment. So again, another foreign key, the sequence and the trigger. And then the rest of this is just inserting data. So I'm inserting into the movies table, we get our unbreakable movie, and then of course the budget lines. You can see where, uh, let's see, so Samuel L. Jackson's getting 7 million, and Bruce Willis is getting 20, and then you'll see Tomb Raider, Terminator 3, and Spider-Man 2. So let's run this script on the movie budget connection. Looks like it's good. We'll refresh this. Never mind. Looks like nothing ran. Let's try that again. All right. Now we'll refresh this. All right. Good, good. We have some tables. So let's move on to part three, where we actually start to use this feature. So the first thing I want to show you is a very basic select star from movie budget lines. We'll run this again using our movie budget connection. And really all I want you to note here is that we have uh, some very basic columns, the ID, movie ID, name, and amount. Now remember what I said before, the way that we enable or get started using uh, Workspace Manager is calling enable versioning. I'm passing in the table name and I'm saying uh, this is with overwrite. I could do a without WO overwrite, um, but in this case, I'm just doing the with overwrite. So I'll enable versioning. And you'll notice that this actually takes a few seconds to run. And the reason why is because it's doing a lot of work. So first of all, this movie budget lines table, the one we're enabling versioning on, this table is going to get modified. First thing it's going to happen, it's going to get renamed. And you can see it adds this underscore LT to the end of the name. In addition to that change, we get some metadata columns that Workspace Manager is going to maintain. We're going to get a new table, this aux table, again with even more columns for Workspace Manager. We're going to get some views. Note that one of the views has the original table name. And then we get some views for doing diffs and history and viewing locks and so on. Oop, all right, it's done. Took about 41 seconds to do that. We also get some indexes, keep things snappy, a procedure. Now, all of this stuff can be undone if you need just by executing disable versioning. It'll set everything back the way it was. But what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna refresh these tables and you'll see that our table is in fact renamed. It's got this underscore LT, we see the Workspace Manager columns and you see this new table. And if I go to views now, you'll see all these views that Workspace Manager creates as well. So we'll come down just a bit and we'll execute the same query that we executed before. Now, why am I showing you this? I said earlier on that your SQL doesn't really have to change. And so this is just to prove that we'll run the same query despite all those additional columns in the base table. You can see that Workspace Manager has created a view with the original columns from the table so that our SQL can now go against this view. And of course, you can imagine there's gonna be an instead of trigger on the view, which is gonna handle all the DML uh, that goes forward on this particular object. All right, so let's get into some Workspace Manager concepts. The first thing we're going to do, of course, is to create a branch. And remember what we did before. I created a branch. I called it Bruce. Uh, I said gets less, but here it's Bruce gets 15 million, right? So that's going to be the name of our workspace. And the movie ID, I just know it is one. So what I need to do is invoke create workspace. And I'm gonna pass in the workspace name and I'm setting auto commit to false because remember I have my own table budget scenarios where I'm gonna store that workspace name. Only I'm relating the workspace name to the movie ID whereas DBMS workspace manager is not gonna do that. So I want these two to succeed or fail as a unit and that's why I don't want the auto commit. I'll commit myself once this other row is gotten in. So we'll go ahead and highlight all that and run it. Excellent. All right. So we have, uh, at this point, we have a new branch, essentially, or a new workspace that we can start to work with. So we'll come down a bit more. 
And the next thing we want to do is start to actually, uh, well, actually, no, before I make any changes, I just want to show you that I can switch to that new workspace that I've created. And when I run this, I'm essentially uh, setting the context for a session, if you will. And so now when I run a query on that view, it's going to take in the workspace uh, that we've set it to um, when it runs. So we see that uh, Bruce Willis is at 20, Samuel L. Jackson is at seven. And if I go to live, and run it again, it's exactly the same because of course we've not made any changes between the two. These workspaces are the same still. All right, so let's come down a bit more. Now we're gonna get into actually making some changes. So what I'll do, again, it's the same workspace that I wanna work with. I'm gonna go to that workspace and then I'm gonna issue two update statements. Again, again it just looks like the base table. Of course, we know it's the view but I'm gonna take uh, Bruce Willis's amount and decrease it from 20 million, uh, which is current, down to 15. Then I'm gonna increase Samuel L. Jackson's amount from 7 million to uh, 12. And then we'll commit those changes. So I'll run that. It says it was successful. Move on down. All right, so now we're gonna do the same thing we just did a moment ago. I'm gonna make the current workspace the new one that we've created. And then when I run this query, we should see the new data. So here at the bottom, we see Bruce is at 15, Samuel Jackson is at 12. And then if I go to live and run this again, in the old or production, you could say, version of the data, Bruce is still at 20 and Samuel Jackson is still at seven. So Pretty cool, right? You can just toggle between workspaces and see how data looked within them. All right, so of course, eventually, you're going to want to merge the workspaces. And so for that, um, what I'm gonna do is first go into the live workspace, since that's the one I want to merge into. And then I'll invoke DBMS WM workspace, uh, merge workspace rather. And I'm gonna specify the workspace name that I wanna merge into live. And then I'm gonna say remove workspace true because I don't need this old workspace anymore. But auto commit again is false because I'm of course going to delete that workspace from my own table, the budget scenarios table, and then commit those two changes as a unit. So we'll select all that and run it. So merging takes a few more seconds on my little VM. All right, so we're merged. And we just need to do one last little check here. So I'm going to make sure we're in the live workspace and then we'll execute the query. And sure enough, it's now production. Bruce Willis is getting a little less at 15 and Samuel Jackson is getting a little more at 12 million. Okay, hopefully that's made it a bit more clear as to what's going on here and how this feature is used. Let's talk a little bit more about how you would uh, turn this into a, a production application because the theory in, in uh, SQL Developer isn't exactly how would, you would use it in, in a production environment. So I'll show you uh, what I mean here. So here I have a, an example. Let me try and zoom in here a bit, make sure it's nice and big, okay. So this is JavaScript. And uh, I should say though that it doesn't matter if you're using Java or if you're using Python or Ruby or whatever, um, the concepts are kind of the same here. So hopefully you can look past the JavaScript if you're not into JavaScript and see how this would apply for whatever language it is that you're using. So the very first thing I'm doing is I'm bringing in Oracle DB. This is the Oracle database driver for Node.js. And then I'm defining a function called get employee uh, which is exposed out and made public at the bottom. So the very first thing I'm doing, I'm returning a promise, which really has nothing to do with Workspace Manager or the stuff that we're talking about here. This just means that um, the function returns a, a, a value that will be resolved in the future. And this just has to do with the asynchronous nature of Node.js, but you can safely ignore that. 
All right, now we get into what does matter. So we have a try block here where we're going to use the driver to get a connection. And this connection is gonna come from a connection pool. And once we have the connection, normally what I would do with the driver is just use it to execute a query. But I can't do that here. What I need to do first is set the context. I need to make sure that I'm going to execute the query while we're in the correct workspace. So before I execute the query, I execute a little PL SQL block here. So just really one liner, um, you know, go to workspace and then there's a bind variable here for the workspace, which refers to the workspace that was passed in. So we're getting the employee based on the employee ID, but in a particular workspace. And once that's done, we've essentially set the context for the connection. Remember, when we get a connection from the database, it's basically a database session. Only when that comes from a connection pool, it's like the session is being reused by multiple users, something to be cognizant of. At any rate, once we've set up the connection, we can then use it to execute the query as we normally would. Again, a bind variable here with MPID coming in. And we should get back a single row, but that row should be from the workspace that we specified above. Now, one thing I did not do, um, you'll see I'm resolving that promise and, and supplying that, that row, the employee that came back, and then closing the connection. Now, one thing I did not do here that I should have done, just didn't uh, waste, take the time to do it for this example, is you know when, when I call close here, if the connection comes from a connection pool, it's not actually closing the connection. It's just releasing that connection, returning it to the pool so that another user can then use it. Now, it's possible that the other code that's pulling the connection out does not do this in the beginning, does not set the workspace uh, back to any sensible default. And so what I might do here, right before releasing this connection, if, if I wanna be a, a good, nice programmer to other developers working on the same team, is uh, go back to the live workspace, just so that the, the next user that comes along uses the same session, they're in live by default and everything works as they would normally expect. So that's, basically how you would go about doing this if your application is based on a three-tier architecture and you're running some kind of middle tier that's making uh, connections to the database from that middle tier. Uh, if you look at my application code, this looks a little bit weird because I'm experimenting with a tool to help make it easier to, to create RESTful web, server, web servers uh, in Node that map to Oracle Database. And so I've been playing with this thing I call SQL Router that creates an express router, uh, expresses the like go-to sort of de facto web server that Node.js folks use. Um, so it creates a router and it basically takes this configuration file here, if you will, and turns it into a router and then routes incoming HTTP requests to the database using the specified SQL. If you don't specify the SQL, it can do things by default. So we see this first entry here is on forward slash movies and then an optional ID maybe in that parameter. And so the table name that I'm mapping this to is movies. Um, by default, if this portion was not here, then I would essentially have you know, the ability would generate for me the get, put, post, and delete SQL, which corresponds, uh, those are the HTTP verbs in the REST communication that would correspond then to like, you know, updates, inserts, deletes, and such against the database. And there's some defaults there. But in this case, I've specified I'm overriding the default get SQL because I'm doing something non-standard here with a subquery for the estimated cost. And ba basically, this is what uh, was executed on the movies tab. Oop, I shut down my web server that back up. All right, so if we refresh this, um, you can actually see in the network tab, let me leave that open and do this again. You can see the request go out uh, for the movies and that's the endpoint that that's listening on and you can see then the response come back with those movies. Now the next one is a little more interesting because of course budget scenarios is the table that, I'm sorry, no, not budget scenarios. This is uh, the one we drill in here on the left where we can create various scenarios. Um, 
So nothing too crazy going on here, although uh, for post, for inserts, this is just a custom PL SQL block that creates a new budget scenario, creates a workspace, and then inserts into my scenarios table. Okay, here's the one I want to show you. So the budget lines table is the one that actually gets, or the movie budget lines, is the table that actually gets version enabled. And so when you think about how would you expose this versioning functionality in, in a REST API, you know, I, I figured there's a few different ways you can do this, right? With, with REST bringing data in, there's usually like four different places where you can get data. Uh, from the URL, you can look at the path and get parameters. You can look at the query string. You could look at the body of an incoming HTTP request. Or, of course, uh, you can look at the HTTP headers. And I went through several different iterations and finally settled on using HTTP headers. So um, if I were to, for example, create a new scenario, and we'll just call this whatever, um, what you'll see then is the budget lines request goes out and in the request headers you'll see i'm i'm specifying that scenario id which in this case this corresponds to the number two and if i go back to live that should be zero and you'll see that reflected here and so what this is doing is uh, essentially plucking the value out from that scenario id and then i run some init and at the bottom, some teardown SQL. And so the post SQL is what runs in between. So basically, uh, this will go to the live workspace if the scenario ID is zero. Otherwise, it'll fetch the correct scenario um, and then go to the workspace based on the name. Um, of course, we've, we've seen this before. Now that we're in the correct, I'm using the same connection for all three of these. Now that we're in the correct sequence uh, or, or uh, context, we can do the insert and, and it'll have a, go into the correct workspace. And then the teardown just resets us back to the live workspace. So this is how I went about implementing it. And hopefully you're, you're, the wheels are starting to turn and you can see how this technology might be used in your own applications. All right, so uh, let's talk about a few things that I think you ought to be aware of. Um, Number one, if the parent table, of course, I should say, there are a lot of things. If you're, if you're going to start using Workspace Manager, there's a lot to learn about it. I'm just covering the very tip of the iceberg here. I'm just really trying to get you motivated and just let you know about a great feature that's there if and when you need it. But um, these are sort of the highlights for me or things that I ran into myself. So the first one is that uh, the parent table, if a parent table is version enabled, and by parent, we we're referring to a foreign key constraint. So in my case, the movies table is the parent of the, the movie budget lines table, right? So if you if I were to enable that movies table, then the children must be enabled too. And that makes sense. You can't version parents without children, right? But you can version children without parents. And that's what I actually did in this example. The next thing is uh, version enabled tables can't be altered as usual. And this kind of makes sense. Um, you know, it has to do with the fact uh, how Workspace Manager works. All that sort of changes, uh, all the changes it did that I showed you a moment ago. In fact, I just want to show you this real quick. If I go in and I say, oh, you know, I want to do an alter against this movie budget lines table, and I just use SQL Developer, and we do a right-click edit, And then we say, okay, well, I'm going to change the data type. It really doesn't matter what we do here because it's going to fail. I'm going to change the data type uh, of a column, and I hit OK, and I get this message. It says error during execution of trigger. So basically what Workspace Manager has done is put a DDL trigger in place, and it says, you know, you can't do direct alters while this table is version enabled. So the team that implemented this feature, they've done a really great job. This feature has been around for a long time. It's, it's not new. It's been supported for many years. And it's quite robust, supports a lot of the database features out of the box. Um, they're going to make sure you don't break it by, by any stretch. So what you have to do, I'll show you in a moment what you have to do to do an alter. Uh, it's, it's a little bit different than you would normally do it. Uh, and finally, this one this one definitely got me. The returning into clause is not supported, unfortunately, with this feature. 
I'm sure there's a technical reason why that I just don't know about. All right, so let's look at how you would do an alter on a version enabled table. The first thing you need to do is invoke the begin DDL and pass in your, your table name. And what this does is it creates a new table name and then appends an underscore LTS to the end. And what you do is you alter that new table. So in this case, alter table movie budget lines underscore LTS and I add a new column, do whatever you need to do, and then you say commit DDL. And so what Workspace Manager then does, it essentially does some diffs between uh, you know, the current table and this new table, figures out what it needs to do and does it in the way that it needs to do uh, without breaking any of its functionality. Okay, I did want you to see at least one other use case, uh, again, just to kind of see the flexibility of Workspace Manager so that you could leverage it in the future if needed. So this is the valid time or effective dating use case. And we're gonna start off with a very simple table, uh, employees, it just has two columns, name and salary. And of course, like before, we're gonna call uh, enable versioning on the employees table. This time it's without overwrite. Also note valid time is set to true. And so Workspace Manager does a little bit differently. In this case, uh, in, in the uh, table, also the view that it creates, we get this WM underscore valid column. And this is a, an object type, um, but let's see how it works. So we're inserting a row of data into the employees table. And the first two columns are normal. We just specify a name and an amount, 40,000. And the second part is a bit more complex. There's a, there's a data type, WM period, that we use, and there's two parts to this. So the, the from and the to, essentially, right? So starting uh, from the year 2000 until the row is changed, we're saying that that is the valid time for this particular row of data. So we commit that change. And then imagine, you know, a lot of time passes, and then I guess yesterday, somebody goes and up dates the row, right? Um, Baxter's finally gotten a raise. I uh, got 5,000 more uh, in salary, and then we commit that change. So basically uh, the same row, um, you know, updated once. So now what we can do with version, uh, with Workspace Manager rather, is use that same package. This time we invoke the set valid time procedure and we say the valid from and the valid till. And if you look at these values, you know, 1900 to 99.99, we're basically saying, you know, all time, right? Just show me uh, everything. And so then when we run this query and you can use the, on this data type, you can use um, valid from and valid till to get access to those properties. And <clears throat> you see that we, it actually looks like we have two rows of data. And so we're seeing the, the salary uh, before and after as well as the valid from and the valid till. But the cool thing is when we actually just wanna see how a row looked at a particular point in time. So uh, what we can do is say, you know what, show me how this looked um, from 2010 to yesterday, and then we're just gonna get the 40,000 or before the change was made. So. It's a very flexible tool that can be used in different ways, just depending, of course, on your use case. All right, well, that's really all I have. I do have some next steps listed here. Um, definitely recommend you check out the doc. It's the Database Workspace Manager Developer's Guide. Uh, also, uh, you know, download and use the test code that I've written if you're interested in it. I'll put the code in the comments on YouTube when this video makes it out there. But of course, you're, <clears throat> excuse me, you're, few, you're free to email me using the email just from the beginning at any point in time, and I'll send the code along and promise I don't do any kind of spamming or anything. You're not going to be on a list or anything like that. Also, I do have uh, a really great slide deck on this technology from the product manager. So I can send that along to you as well, and you can get a lot more information about how this tool is used at a higher level. Uh, and then finally, if you need a database to test this technology with, I highly recommend uh, use the same database VM that I used here today. 
All you need to do is just go to Google and search for Oracle VMs. It'll probably come up without the S2. And you'll see a page. Actually, I'll just go ahead and show you. So we have a little extra time. It's usually the first link that comes in, pre-built developer VMs. You can see these are VirtualBox VMs. So you're going to start by downloading and installing VirtualBox. Once that's done, this is the, the VM I recommend to use. It's the Database App Development VM. You'll see it's got Oracle Linux 7. It's got Oracle Database 12C R2, um, lots of other features built in. So you download that. It's a rather large download, but it's jam-packed with all the functionality you need. And you can, of course, test this feature as well. OK. so. Let's open it up to see if there are any questions. And I'll wait just uh, about 20 seconds or so. I know there's a delay. So we'll give it a few seconds. Hi, Dan. How are you? This is Francisco. Can you hear me? 